if it's cool with you, if we could just do a, a quick introduction for my colleagues and, and audience that don't know you, um, yep. if you're able to just introduce yourself, what you do and kind of how you got to where you are. Yeah, for sure. Hi, everyone. So my name is Dimitri, and uh, I'm currently part of the leadership development program at RBC. So it's basically a rotational program where um, you would do uh, four different rotations of your choosing. So you can kind of rotate through any division of the bank you want. And then after that, you get, you get placed in a permanent uh, uh, senior, se senior leadership role kind of a thing. And then the whole idea of the program is to kind of groom the future leaders of the bank. And then these rotations are uh, used to kind of serve us to uh, like learn where our strengths are, what we like, what kind of area we want to focus in. So that's what I'm doing right now. And I'm currently on my fourth rotation right now with uh, RBC Ventures actually. So it's, uh, it's a division that uh, kind of helps um, grow businesses internally as well as maybe acquire some businesses externally. So it's a pretty cool group. Nice. I've actually, I, I didn't even really realize how active RBC Ventures was until just recently. And I feel like they're just popping up everywhere. Have you guys kind of like ramped up your activity as of late? Uh, yeah, well, there's actually been a lot of money that we were spending for that group because it's a very profitable group for the bank. Um, right. And then uh, there's like a whole bunch of different businesses popping up in pretty much every possible sector you can imagine. Right. I'm currently part of uh, a group that basically helps companies incorporate. So right. then we have about 50,000 businesses that registered with us already. So, and then right now we're actually analyzing how this whole COVID uh, impact is going to reflect on all of our future projections, everything else like that. So, right. So what does that look like from 30,000 feet? Like, it, what is that? Is that a model that you guys are working on right now? Well, we just have a PNL model right now. So basically we have a certain amount of uh, like clients we assume to kind of onboard uh, certain conversions into deposits into the bank. And right now we kind of have to revise all the statements right. and everything. So we're looking at that right now. And then uh, we're actually trying to roll out a, prog a program to help our businesses too. So we're tr trying to do some grants to right. help qualified businesses get some money because businesses are struggling right now. Right. So for sure. So we're doing that. And I mean, just, yeah, just kind of trying to assess the economy as it comes. Right. So, yeah. Do you think that we'll see as much sort of small, small business loan activity or, or appetite as they're, I guess, trying to put together in the States right now, or, or is that kind of just uh, a sh like smoke and mirrors in the U S as well? Do you think? <laughs> Uh, you're talking about the stimulus packages that you said? Yeah, the spend the small business focused ones, yeah. Um, I don't think Canada has the resources that the states do, right. so I don't really anticipate where you're going to be coming, coming out with anything as big as that. And I mean, the recent one that you came out with fr on Friday was, was just loans, really. So I mean, it's yeah. kind of a temporary fix, I think, right? It's just going to give people money, but then they're still going to have to pay it all back. So I mean, it can help in the short term, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really solve the problem, I think. Right. Yeah, you're just kicking the can further down the road, I suppose. Pretty much. So, and I mean, I think Canada is obviously doing everything we can to um, kind of help out businesses, individuals, everyone. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think you kind of have to do your own financial planning just to make sure you're staying afloat. Because I mean, for sure, I think this has made it apparent how how few people took that that obligation seriously. Like, I think you know, it was only three weeks of this, and it, before people were realizing they weren't going to be able to pay their mortgages and, and, um, yeah. and their rent. So that's, you know, that's, that's alarming within itself, I guess, on a the consumer well, level. It's crazy. Yeah. I was reading a stat. They're saying that uh, the average household in Canada only has three months of savings before yeah. they run out of money. Right. right. So, so that's pretty astonishing. I think people just need to kind of save more, I think, to protect. Right. Themselves. Well, and if you, depending on how that average is, is calculated, like if you, if you account for all of the extreme wealth, then that would mean that there's actually a, a far greater number of people who don't have that than there are mm -hmm. who do, right? Uh, True. Like in the U.S., it's like most people are what is it? Can't couldn't couldn't cover a four hundred dollar emergency expense? I think That's crazy Something like that. Yeah. Um, on uh, on an individual level, how have how have things changed for you? Like, what would, what did a typical workday look like for you? Let's say a month ago, or maybe five weeks ago, versus today as a result of COVID. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, normally I'd come into the head office downtown Toronto. So we'd come there to the office, everyone and just work from there. And that was the typical day. You'd just come there, collaborate with everyone and work. But uh, right now we're uh, strongly encouraged not to come to the office. For sure. So they're, they're actually suggesting we can just work from home. So uh, right now we're just basically just doing teleconferencing calls and just doing work remotely, right? So. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. And then in, in the industry, like, you, you know, you mentioned a couple of things uh, right off the bat, which I, I think will, will shed a little bit of light for people who are curious about what's going on here. But what, uh, 
I guess on a more macro level, like what kind of changes are you guys seeing from your lens in the space, be it through lending or uh, capital markets, whatever it is? Um, and, and do you expect to see more of that change? Well, I think from the capital markets perspective, we just became much more conservative. I mean, you've, right. you've seen what happened with the equities is just volatile like crazy. You, sure. you can't really predict what's happening. So I think, I think everyone's really worried. I know that they pretty much did almost like a hiring freeze for the trading floor and uh, just the capital markets in general, because right now there's not much activity going on there. And RBC as a bank itself, we try to restrict our capital markets activity to uh, no greater than 25%, mm -hmm. just because we don't want to get exposed to a situation like this and then get wiped yeah. out, right? So, smart, smart. So that's been, uh, we haven't been making as much money while things were going well because we we're artificially uh, right. keeping our capital markets, but right now it actually paid off because RBC is a very conservative bank. and Yeah. Uh, I think it's good for things like that but lower exposure uh, right yeah no exactly but otherwise i think we're expecting a lot more defaults and mortgages right right so credit card defaults all of that type of stuff so that's going to happen and then um i mean i've talked to some of the executives of the treasury and i know they're saying that there's uh things are not doing that great not as great as they hoped right so right, right. and the thing with uh when uh, when we take on like foreclosed properties we have to put them back on our balance sheet and the banks don't like that yeah. because our liquidity ratio gets kind of screwed up and then right. uh, we have to put it back on our balance sheet and we have to keep more liquid funds so right. the banks they really don't like um keeping keeping uh, real estate on their balance sheets right so then, I mean, by that logic, you guys might be, and, and maybe this is what we're seeing in, in the retail banking kind of right now and the mortgage lending is a lot of the banks are, are really doing as much as they can to make it, make people uh, able to, to weather the storm, right? Like the, I think the deferral program, I've heard, I've heard kind of mixed emotions about it, but you know, some of the, some of the people are saying that the referral program has been really helpful. Others are saying that they're getting rejected almost instantly because they have savings. And so is that, do you think that that the the if we are seeing defaults that's going to occur sort of after that period when people are obligated to start paying again or what's tough to say i'm not part of retail banking so right. i don't exactly know what their division does out there so i've never been in a branch um yeah. but i mean i gotta know i guess i can't speculate right now on that right okay fair enough um okay and do you do you think that things are going to change more or do you kind of think we've we've hit the worst point so far um you know you mentioned equities a little bit do you do you think that things are going to continue to get ugly or the volatility or will continue like i mean it looks like the the not not qe in the u.s seems to be working a little bit uh yeah. at least but you know I, I think powell seemed to announce that the timing of it was very convenient on thursday with the the next round of stimulus so i don't know if at this point they're gaming the market and it's market manipulation or if it's if it's really having a lasting impact um but but bef i guess under that layer just like sort of at a consumer level or debt assets whatever it is that you think is is going to be driving the change do you expect to see more of it uh, this is my personal opinion, but I actually think this is kind of get, get going to get a lot worse before this gets better, in my right. opinion. Economically, so I think, right? uh, huh? Say again? Like economically, it'll get worse? Uh, I think both economically and like on the equity side as well. Um, right. Everything is going to get worse because it just started. I mean, really, it has yeah. only hit Canada for about a month. Yeah. And we've never had such a severe shock of the economy before. Pretty much the whole economy is on standstill. Right. right. So, so right now, people are kind of becoming more optimistic because they think that the peak has been re reached, but I mean, right now, no one has ever had an event like this before. Right. So no one knows if there's going to be a second wave of this coming, how long the businesses will have to shut down. And even if we do reopen the economy, I think it's going to take time for things to go back to normal. For sure. So I actually think the effects are going to be much bigger. And uh, the equities, I actually think, especially on the equity side, everything's going to go down in the short term. I think. Right. Yeah, I'm sort of a similar philosophy. And I think probably one of the big looming, I, I mean, we have a lot of banks reporting earnings next week. So that might, you know, ha have an impact. But I think, I don't even know if the Q1 earnings are really going to come across that bad, because it was really only half of March that that we lost mm -hmm. this. And but Q2, I think could be could be really ugly. And, and, and I'm, that's my fear is, you know, even if we do see some recovery between now and then, yeah. once we start to get the your Q2 earnings coming in, um, I think people are going to realize like, you know, a lot of these fundamentals have, have eroded, at least in the short term. And, and that's a very difficult thing to come back from, I suppose. No, exactly. I mean, what are you going to do with all the unemployed people right now? Just in March, Canada laid off, what, a million people? And yeah. the States had 17 million, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 
and this is just going to keep happening. So these people sure. are not going to get instantly rehired, right? So. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the big challenge. And, cons- and when people don't have jobs, they're not out spending their money. So, you know, as a result, I, I suppose, you know, things slow down just in general as well, right? No, exactly. Um, what kind of advice are you giving to friends, coworkers, colleagues, clients, whatever it is in in right now or or are you kind of hesitant to even do that just because the the um the market is sort of unpredictable like are you not trying to form any conclusions or or give any advisory um i personally think to be very cautious here i think it's very good to be cautious in this sense and then just listen to what the government the health professionals are saying keep the yeah. social distancing try and like stay healthy yourself and then other than that, don't really go back into the market, maybe for the equity side, <laughs> you know, right. don't start putting all your money thinking that there's going to be a huge recovery coming yeah. up because uh, you could lose a lot of money that way. For sure. Yeah, I think that that's probably the, the most sound advice that you're able to, to give without taking any risk, right, is, is just encourage people to be as aware and gather as much information as possible and, and form their own opinions. Cause like, there's a lot of, of good info available there. That's sort of why I, I was lucky early. I just, I started reading about this on Reddit and, and um, on the coronavirus subreddit. And it, it, I think I just got really, really spooked. So I probably was a little bit over cautious. Like I kind of thought we were going to have like civil unrest and, you know, people were going to oh. come and like start stealing stuff from my house and whatever, but, and which, you know, like it is, it's better to be better to be safe than sorry, I suppose. But sure. I, uh, I just think it's funny, you know, that, that, and I had taken everything out of the, the equities market and, bought a little bit of uh you know you know some some bear funds um yeah. just and and i got lucky right um and so that's been that's why i've been able to like well why i've been trying to do this as much as possible is just talk to as many qualified people as i know to start gathering information because every client that i'm on the phone with today is is having is asking me the same question you know what's going to happen and i'm like i don't know but yeah. i can i can try and find out and and that's what i'm actively doing right now right yeah, I think no one knows at this point, right? So we're all kind of yeah. speculating at this point, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure, I so agree. Which uh, which bear market equities did you get into? Like inverse ETFs? Or? Yeah, yeah. I had some, uh, I guess they're all downgraded to 2X now, but I was on some of the Horizons ones that were on um, uh, on the TSE and then a couple of the ones from Direction in the US. I think SQQQ, which oh, that one was rough. NASDAQ's a pretty resilient market, like all those, uh, especially the top 100, right? Yeah. Um, so, but, but I still made some on that. I, I, I have some left from sort of the first drop that I'm down a little bit, but I didn't even realize it paid out a dividend at some point in the middle there, which was hilarious. Oh, um, really? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, funny. yeah. And then, um, let me think, uh, HXD, which is TSX, uh, inverse two X on, uh, that's traded on the TSE. Um, oh, nice. I'm trying to think, but yeah, and just a couple other ones. Like I've been playing HOU, which is the oil, um, 2X oil uh, yeah. up. Uh, um, and then, yeah, otherwise just like picking up uh, stock of companies that I'd be okay to be left with. Um, you know, sh- should they go up? Like if I see them really take a hit, I'll, I'll buy and, and as they recover, I'll flip out and keep my keep my equity in. So I'm just gradually collecting. Um, but I, I, I'm of the same position as you, I think. Um, we do have a lot further to go down. So I'm just being careful with my money and trying to try and protect it and make as much as I can on the way down. So I'm guessing you should have invested more into SQQ or as Dow, something like that, right? Last week on, fr- on, thir- on Thursday this week. Yeah. Well, I loaded up a little bit more like I would, I did uh, as things were getting greener, but I don't know. I like, it's really tough for me to, to like, I, you feel like you're b- just battling the money printing machine in the U S at this point, right? Cause they're just pumping so much liquidity into the market. And I honestly really feel like, I think I, I think I overestimated how quickly this would happen. And that's why like, and, and these, these inverses, they, they decay, right. As a result yeah. of the rebalancing. So you don't want to be stuck with it for too long. No, and, definitely not. and so now I'm kind of in that position. It's like, do I cut my losses or, and then, so I loaded up a little bit in hopes I did get some, when Boris Johnson went into the hospital, I did get some, um, I don't know what the other, the one is on the FTSE inverse, but, uh, I'm glad to see he's he's recovering. So that's you know like those are the those are the trades you don't really want to to work out, right? Yeah, no, <laughs> you're sure buying them, hoping that you're wrong. 
Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Well, we'll see what happens because it had the biggest rally I've heard since 1938 last week. At, yeah, at yeah. S and P 500, which is crazy. And I mean, you know, it follows usually after the biggest rally, right? For sure. So. For sure. I just wonder if it's going to be that soon. But yeah, I mean, the writing's on the wall, right? Like re- history is yeah. bound to repeat itself, and and I think yeah. I don't know. Everyone wants to say this time it'll be different. It's like, yeah, it is already different. We like we've never been exposed to a, a, a black swan like this. So yeah. don't yeah. don't go trying to predict. <laughs> No, That's it's bad. true. It's true. But I do think equities have been a bit overinflated uh, sure, over yeah, the years yeah. too, because I mean, oh, it's yeah. been like the biggest be- uh, uh, bull market pretty much. Yeah. I think 10 years they're growing just nonstop, yeah. right? Yeah, basically so. since 08, like they basically started pumping that liquidity into the market. And then, I mean, even lately, like they were just ramping up the bond repurchases in like what, January, February, like that's yeah. why the last year has just been obscene. And, and the, the first drop, we really only saw the gains of that market get wiped away. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, I, th- I still think, yeah, I think that there's a lot of froth on top of the market where there's really the detachment from fundamentals. I mean, we see it in real estate too. Uh, I mean, like condos in the city, it seems like there's a big flood of supply happening right now. For right? Sure, yeah. I think that's those, where people can make money now, right? <laughs> right, yeah. They, those Airbnbs, like, I think that, that like, I was kind of trying to predict, I'm like, what's going to come into the market first, right? Because you're, yeah. I honestly think you're starting to see that race to the bottom phenomenon already. Like, yeah. There was condos going for 900 bucks that were, you know, 1250 two yeah. weeks prior. No, for sure. For sure. I'm, I'm noticing that too. I'm just kind of took a look and then I think all the, all the pre-construction, yeah. these are, these are going to suffer a lot right now. Well, that's the thing, right? But, and my fear there is those are insured deposits and those, those buyers could just decide to walk away. I mean, because like the developers are really enticing people with, low deposit structure at a yeah. certain point right so like a lot of these guys they they only put in five yep. percent and you think they're going to be ponying up the next two and a half increments over the next two exactly. years exactly. or the next year going into a market where prices aren't increasing i mean I, that's my big fear is i think a lot of those and and the question becomes once you've got half of your people walk away from the deposits is what do you do with this half built construction site now right do you pivot into purpose-built rental or what you know I think you're going to run into the situation what happened in Calgary. (laughs) So if you look at the market there, there's some developers that are still sitting on their units um, Mm -hmm. four years back. Right. Right. So then, then they've dropped their prices like here, like in Calgary, they've dropped about five, 50 to 60% already from the highs of when they were initially advertising. I don't think it's going to get as bad in uh, in Toronto, obviously just because of the demand, but I do think it could uh, go a bit lower, especially for the pre-constructions. Yeah, for sure. I think there was definitely some, some, uh, a little bit of excess speculation there that could could get kind of that'll wither away but i agree with you i think once prices come down a, like enough you're going to see mass opportunism enter the market like yeah. i mean guys like you and i right i think we're going to be scooping up property once we feel yeah. like the the i i it, to me it's the, the one of the big challenges that we're entering right now also is that for the next two months you're not going to see there's no comparables like so speculation is always based on the most recent comp right but there's no comps to to for an appraisal to qualify that on so ever more importantly than you know than than historically you're gonna have to look at the fundamentals of units and and so now all of a sudden if you're if you were planning to buy a a condo at a negative cap rate because you felt it was going to go up in value the bank's just going to say go away right and then and so that's that's another phenomenon because the the credit markets are just getting so much tighter as well, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And so many people are getting unemployed. All the people who took on properties thinking they're going to have their jobs, mm-hmm. some of them mm-hmm. maybe lost the jobs. What do yeah. they do now, right? So right, or yeah, or even even if you're like if you think about a lot of the the like these condo investors that were paying, you know, they're losing money after condo fees, taxes, like TMI or, you know, the Airbnbs that are now vacant. I mean, those, those are all on the market already. You can see it. Like there's a couple of guys, even guys who I thought were going to hold out. I've seen like even clients of my own put them on the market. Right. Wow. Um, but, uh, but the, but even the rentals like that lose less money than the Airbnbs in a, in a bad market, but mm-hmm. now all of these people can't pay their rent. And, mm-hmm. and so you, if you were losing money before, and counting on the, the property to go up in value indefinitely in order to make your return. Now, all of a sudden you're like, okay, I might as well just get rid of this thing and cut my losses. Right. Pretty much. And then, yeah. 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 Are you well, pretty crazy times? Yeah. Crazy times. We'll see yeah. what happens from this. For sure. For sure. Are you feeling relatively opportunistic? Like you think there's going to be a pretty good buying opportunity in the real estate side? Oh, hugely. I'm actually really excited to see what comes out on the other side. So yeah. I'm yeah. really, I'm really excited. So I want to, I want to see, and I'm keeping my eye on the market, but I'm just going to hold out. But I think uh, 
this is the buying opportunity for a lot of people. I would agree. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of people kind of sitting in the woodwork. Hopefully they also have their jobs, right? So they can go qualify for a mortgage yeah. because yeah, I, I do agree with you. I think, I, I think actually, to be honest, I, I don't think we'll see people get as destroyed as we did in the equities market. Like I think, no. and I feel like you have a similar position. I think prices could come down to a realistic level. And, and yeah. I think that that's a good thing. Cause like we're seeing, I mean, the leading indicators are already there. Price like um, sale to list price ratio went up to like 106% in like three weeks that was about a month ago and now it's come down about it was like 106 week over, and then week over week it was like 106 104 102 and then two weeks at 98 percent. so hopefully things kind of just like if, if we can just find a balanced market yeah that would be nice but if we start seeing like a supply flood and people racing to the bottom it could get ugly and i think it's really just going to dep- depend a lot on vendors at this point yeah so that's yeah, no, cool. i can definitely see that all right, man. Um, yeah, I, I want to be mindful of your time. So is there anything else that you want to add or discuss uh, before we sign off? Um, I mean, I'm just curious to see like how, how you're doing, how are your whole clients doing, like what's happening on your side there? Yeah. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I guess before I was, um, I was pretty, pretty paranoid in, in regards to this whole thing happening. Um, and so most of the clients, like every client that I have had and been working with, especially on the buy side, like sellers, I was just saying, get in the market, get it sold right now. Like his prices were going crazy and, and, and there was a huge supply scarcity going into like February. Yeah. And so I was, if you had a, if you had a property to, to sell, I was like, get it up now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that worked well for us. Mm-hmm. Um, buyers, I was a little bit more reluctant because I really did feel like COVID was going to have a huge impact on the Canadian market. And I don't know how quantifiable, quantifiable that impact will be on the price side, especially sort of in like the Northern GTA or York region. Mm -hmm. Um, but I still felt that, you know, there would be, we'd be presented with better buying opportunities toward the spring. So I basically said, you know, if I couldn't find somebody, the perfect property that I really felt could weather the storm Mm -hmm. and I wasn't, I wasn't recommending people purchase. And we had a lot of buyers who just kind of, you know, they found the right thing and they were just like, I can wait, I can wait this out. If this thing doesn't sell, then I'll buy it in a couple of months for less money. Right. Um, That makes sense. Yeah. How's How's the Georgina real estate market? Georgina's strong. Uh, it went, I mean, I, I think again, like what we've seen lately, especially with them talking about peeling back to stress tests. I mean, prior to all of this happening, because they've kind of uh, rescinded on that. Um, but it was, it, it's a price floor market, right? Like I think entry, the entry level was growing. Like that's why you see condo growth. Uh, that's why you see growth in, in like Hamilton, Guelph, Kitchener, Waterloo, like they're the similar, similarly priced, right there. Yeah. And so I, I think that I, I think that CMHC's goal for the whole policy environment was to to stimulate growth on the price floor and mm-hmm. you know let a lot of those marginalized buyers come back into the market as a result of 2017. Like everybody got, who got suppressed, mm-hmm. and it seemed to be working. I, I actually really think that, and you're seeing average price come down now. But I don't. I actually think it's just because more of the volume is concentrated on the bottom end of the market, right? Like a lot of the smart money, let's call it your the the high net worth individuals who would be buying above the median are exiting a little bit, mm-hmm. um, and just kind of doing a wait and see because they can afford to. But you still get a lot of opportunism in those entry level because they're like, oh, this is an awesome awesome opportunity. And people like if you're planning to hold the asset for the rest of your life, you can afford to take that risk. And it's only 400k versus four million, yeah. so. Uh, so it, it's it's actually still strong like the prices haven't really been affected volume obviously is decreased but mm-hmm. listing volume increased uh proportionately so like if you have a 50 percent decrease in listings and a 50 percent decrease in sales mm-hmm. you know you're still sort of in a in a su- supply scarce market and, right. and prices have sustained whether or not that continues i i don't know but i i think it's the same thing as like what we just talked about there's still, there's always going to be opportunism because there's people like the investment theses of the public are so polar, right? You can get some people who are like, everything's going to go to shit and we're all going to die and whatever. And then some people are like, yeah, this is the greatest day ever. Like I can't wait to buy a property at 10% below market value. Cause by the end of the year, it's going to go up 50%, you know? Yeah. Like, so it really, there's so much, I don't know. And, and it's, that's what makes this whole thing fun, right? It's like, you yeah. get to work with the philosophies that your clientele has right no that's fair yeah no that's fair how are the virtual tours like what's happening on that side uh i don't people are pretty reluctant to do it but like like well not really i don't know it's just it doesn't really have the impact i don't think that that we thought it was going to like mm-hmm. if people are gonna go if people really want to purchase in this market they are 
they're going to look at properties, you know, like they're mm -hmm. willing to take the risk. And, and the people who, who don't want to purchase in this market just aren't doing it. Um, yeah. And good. so like, I don't know, I guess it's hard to, hard to really like validate the consumption of them, especially because like there was kind of a, a one, one or two week period where nobody really knew whether or not like it was socially acceptable to still put your property on the market or whatever. So now we're like just kind of getting into that whole like digital real estate phase. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, like I'm not doing showings or anything really. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've mailed out quite a few of like those VR headsets and stuff. So, mm -hmm. but I've, I haven't had anybody request that like I go through a property and take the the tour for them. So, so you don't think it'll transform the industry down the road to make no, it? Like, no, 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 I, okay. really don't. I think it's just, I, I think like, I think that if you were going to see a, a big migration toward tech in the real estate space, Mm -hmm. um, it would have already happened. Like, I think that you'll slowly get those things happening. And I mm -hmm. think that there are, um, I think that people, people are becoming more inclined to do that stuff, especially as like the, our population grows up and, and increases in buying power. Mm -hmm. But I, I still think the people who hold all the money in the market don't, aren't the ones that are consuming that stuff. And so until you see, I think it's the migration of capital that's really going to cause the shift towards technology. Right. Yeah. Like I think it's having an impact, but I don't think, and I think that that right now is going to be one of the points that's going to make that exceptionally clear, mm -hmm. but I don't think that it's had the impact that most people would have anticipated, you know, like five years ago when we thought that it was possible to have an Uber of real estate. Right. Right. No, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's see what happens, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm really interested to see. Is that a, is that a um, RBC ventures field question? <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. It's just me. I'm just interested. Right? Yeah, so I yeah. just joined the team actually a couple of weeks ago. So right. I'm just still kind of new, still learning everything. But uh, uh, yeah, I was yeah. just curious if you were doing some market analysis on me. No, no, no. <laughs> maybe, maybe I will down the road. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, for, sure, <laughs> for sure. We, uh, we've actually been building some automations for the real estate space, um, with a tech team. Like I just built them for myself and for the agents that I work with. Um, and, and they'll probably end up being market products um so one is like just a feed that takes your listings from treb and puts them on your instagram and the other one is um a uh, automated valuation software for mm -hmm. for brokers so and that those are like that the especially that one is becoming more popular right now because agents don't want to go to somebody's house to do a cma or whatever right 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 um and so i i think that like my vision for kind of where the the real estate market's going to end up is I call it computer assisted real estate or care. So sort of like CAD. Mm -hmm. um, it, basically agents will be paid to do what agents should be paid to do, which is think critically. And then anything that they shouldn't be paid to do that because a computer can do it better is mm -hmm. like, and that, that comes down to like automated valuation, you know, uh, even photographing or reviewing a property, creating a, a floor plan, like whatever it is, a lot of those things I think are going to start getting pulled out and they already are like agents are subcontracting like 80% of the work of marketing a property. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So that's kind of my philosophy on it. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Anything else you want to discuss before we sign off? Uh, no, I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you for having me, Dan. I appreciate that. Always good to chat with you, hear your input. I probably should have contacted you sooner when this all happened, right? So. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I, I mean, I'll give you a call. Definitely. I think that there's, uh, there's going to be some good opportunities. Um, I actually have a couple in Hamilton that just came across my desk. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll email those over to you. But nice. I mean, Perfect. because we're, we're, we're tied in pretty intimately with the finance side of things, um, you know, we can see some of the, the really ugly stuff that's happening prior. Yeah. Um, so I'll definitely discuss that with you, uh, yeah, uh, definitely off camera though, but, um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I really appreciate your time and I appreciate your insight. I think it's going to bring a lot of value to a lot of people. So, uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day and, um, stay safe out there. Thank you, Dan. You as well. You as Thanks, well. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Okay. Yeah, man, for yeah. sure. Take care. Yeah. Take care. Bro. See you.